Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to CIBC Presents Entrepreneurship 101. Um, tonight's lecture is on basics of HR. Um, and before we get to the lecture, um, I have a job posting to tell you about. It seems singularly appropriate. This was not planned. Trust me. Um, there is a posting on the Mars website for a job. Um, it's an associate uh, with the Business Advisory Services Group uh, here at Mars. And I think you know that's the core engine here at Mars of the uh, senior folks who advise all the entrepreneurs and, and companies that come in. This is a, an entry-level position, basically at front end, assisting in screening companies, understanding um, their needs, helping matching them to our pool of advisor resources. Um, it is posted on the Mars website, uh, if you look under careers. Um, it does close on Friday, but I know many of you, uh, you know, have approached me saying, you know, are there jobs at Mars? How can I get something at Mars? Well, there actually is something. Um, and as I say, I couldn't think of a better day to be able to tell you about it. So that enough said, go check it out if you're interested. Um, so I am truly delighted to uh, introduce tonight's speaker, who in our discussions turns out to be my longest serving volunteer speaker in this entire program but shows the important of, importance of HR. Um, it's not just as simple as getting your buddies to join you in your company and saying, yeah, we'll share and this and all that. Um, it is uh, it's something that needs to be done carefully. It is crucial uh, in the success of your business in choosing the right people and following the right procedures so you don't get yourself in trouble. Um, Tammy Sturge, our speaker tonight, is a partner in HR and a founder of HR Transformations, uh, Inc. Um, she has been an HR professional with companies like Procter & Gamble, uh, Ericsson Telecom, Cyberplex. Um, so she has earned her spurs out with bigger companies and is now operating as, as an independent uh, company providing these services. And I'm going to steal some of her thunder. It's never too early to engage an HR professional in your company, right? Um, uh, I will say it. Yeah, I'm not uh, promoting services, but trust me, um, just like I've said before, you need the accountant, you need the lawyer, you need HR advice far earlier than you think, because if you don't, you will be getting it when you need to get out of the hole that you've got yourself into. Uh, so um, HR Transformations provides organizational development, training, and general HR. Now, Tammy, actually, this is new. This is new from last year. Uh, you can see Tammy on Workopolis on Tuesday and Wednesday evenings as the corporate confidant on the Business News Network, providing workplace advice. So with that intro, Tammy, over to you. I'm actually, thank you. I'm actually not here to sell HR services, but I am here to sell you if you are an entrepreneur or ever thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, as I believe most of you are, I am here to sell you on the idea of planning your HR strategy and approach early in your entrepreneurial career. Because here's my business partner likes to say this. She says, Tammy, anyone thinks they can open a restaurant or go into HR? So pretty much everyone thinks it's fairly simple and therefore they don't actually think about it. And what we see, this is what would be typical. You start up a company, the last thing on earth you think about is hiring anybody to work for, with you in HR. You think about finance, you, you hire a finance person pretty darn early. You hire a product person, pro hire a technology person. You might hire a marketing person. And then at about 25 people, you will call me and you will say something like this. I went into this business because I wanted to build an X, a widget, a wadget, or I wanted to provide this great technology service. 
And instead, I spend 80% of my time dealing with people issues because now I have 25 people working for me and that's not what I went into business to do. That's, that's what you will call me and tell me. And then I will very politely not tell you and that's what you're going to be doing for the rest of your entrepreneurial life unless you, first of all, you, you know, accept it and say I am going to put some plans and strategies in place or you hire somebody to do that work for you. That could be a COO or somebody who's going to manage all the people stuff and you are going to go do all the think tanking stuff that you wanted to do originally or you, or you have some kind of HR support. Whichever those choices are, remember, I, I told you first. So this is what we wanted to talk about today. What do you actually need to know about human resources? So I would say pretty much the life cycle of the employee is the hiring, the firing, and then how do you pay and manage people in between. That's mostly what entrepreneurs uh, usually need to know in my experience. So these are the topics we were going to cover. And here are some resources. There's two slides of resources. I'm not going to click on these, but they're in the presentation and they're always available to you. So there are free HR tools. I always advise you to get familiar with the Employment Standards Act. There are um, some nice um, you know, shortcuts on, in, on the Employment Standards site that says, you know, if you want to know about, you know, for instance, the upcoming uh, violence and harassment legislation, you can look here uh, very you know, quickly. They'll, they usually have some uh, good um, uh, pieces on that. Human Rights Commission is also another good place to look at, especially since they have more powers than ever now. And then here's again some tools on how to do all those things from hiring to firing and everything in between. So there are lots of tools out there. It's not that you don't have access to them. So um, hiring practices. So here's how I normally find entrepreneurs hire. They have a buddy, like Tony said. And they know that they've worked with the buddy, they know he's brilliant technically, he's interested in the same thing you are. And so you say, hey, why don't you come in and I'll pay you and then we'll, you know, we'll figure it out as we go along. That actually works for the first couple of years. And then again, when you're about 25 people or somewhere along the way, you end up calling and saying, and now that person is no, has not grown with the company. They have not actually developed the skills that I needed them to develop, but they're my best friend, brother-in-law, wife, sister, et cetera, and I can't get rid of them. What do I need to do? And then we start doing all that beautiful workaround stuff. So where you actually organize a company so that you can work around those people who you are not willing to exit out of the organization. So one of the biggest pieces of advice um, I can give you is, Hire for who you want five years from now. So hire somebody with, you can see that they're going to have a skill set five years from now that it's what you're going to need and want. Hire people who can work well in an organization is another piece of advice I would give. Not just be able to do the technical functional skill that you have, but they can actually work with other people. It's just not worth it. It's just not worth it to have people that you can't actually work with long term or that other people can't. You may be able to work with the peculiarities of your high school buddy and no one else may be able to. And you, you probably know that. The other thing I would say is, is, so a lot of people, they just can't be bothered to write out what it is they really want. But you know, there's a, there's a purpose to writing, it's to clarify your thinking. Even if you are not going to have to align with anyone else, but if you do have a partner, then it is helpful for you to align on, and I've seen partners say, oh yeah, we know exactly what we want, and I say, great, well, you know, just indulge me, let's go through the process of writing it out. No, nope, they don't have the same ideas at all. So that's, the, that's really the purpose of a job description, is to clarify your thinking and align yourself with anybody else who needs to be aligned. And then, of course, as part of clarifying your thinking is, so what's the mandate? That's more critical than what's the tasks. The tasks will change. The mandate may not. It may, but it'll change more slowly than the tasks. And then what are the skills that you need? And by the way, I really uh, advise you not to write down good communication, good interpersonal skills, good computer skills. Everyone has those on every job on the planet. Really try to look and see what are the three to five skills I can't live without unless I get these. 
It takes some thinking. So searching for a candidate, uh, obviously there's a lot of internet searching to do. These days LinkedIn is a big place to do searching. So you can search for companies that you're interested in, um, in plucking people from. You can search for experience sets. You can search, search for skill sets. So all those kinds of things. Um, and then for sure, you know, use your network, send it out. So you don't have to spend a lot of money, but use all of the outreach techniques that you can. Some people are Twittering jobs now. I mean, all of those things are happening. And you can call candidates directly. You know, you can, you can get a list of candidates on LinkedIn that you're not linked in with and then call them. Say, hi, you know, would you be interested in coming to work for me? Be your own headhunter. So here are the pitfalls. So I mentioned the second one already. The first one is, yes, hiring someone for their pulse factor. When I went to Cyberplex, so it was an internet company, so that was during the time of the boom. And uh, one of the things that um, I realized when, in my first week there was that we had 35% turnover. And so I analyzed, well, why do we have 35% turnover? And what I found was that uh, most of the people we fired within their first six months because we kept hiring people into jobs because we needed them quickly. So especially if you're in a growth organization, you hire people without truly, and you think that you're ahead of the game, and really, of course, six months down the road, you haven't got results, you spent a lot of time training them, you paid them for six months, and now you have to fire them and start all over again. So better to do that thinking up front, even if it is important to you to get somebody quickly. And then the last uh, point here is, so uh, a lot of, I would say, entrepreneurs, uh, not-for-profit organizations and high-tech organizations hire people and they say, well, they are on contract, not really understanding what that means. So Revenue Canada gets to define what a contractor is versus an employee. It's not you. And it has implications because if you have an employee, you're supposed to be remitting CPP and EI. And you're supposed to be, if you have benefits in your company, you're supposed to be giving them um, severance, benefits, et cetera. You're treating them like an employee. But it's not cut and dried, and that's one of the reasons why people have um, you know, trouble saying, well, I have a contract or I have an employee, because Revenue Canada doesn't just say, it's this, this, and this. It's a number of things on a continuum. So, for instance, do they work at your office or do they work at their home? That's one of the defining points. Are they using your computer, so your tools, your computer, your admin assistant, or are you cross-charging them for those things? Part of the definition. Do they work full-time or do they work part-time? It's still not you know, completely conclusive, but it helps. Do they have only you as a client? Have they been with you for more than one year? I used to work with an organization that at 364 days, they laid everybody off for a day. They terminated their employment for one day, and then they hired them back. That was one of the ways they kept out of, wasn't the only way, but that's one of the ways they kept out of a, an employment-like relationship. Are they paid versus in your payroll versus invoices? And if they are making more than $30,000 a year, are they charging you GST? And do you provide the person with ongoing direction? Revenue Canada can actually fine you, by the way, as well as asking for all that CPP and EI you haven't remitted, they can actually fine you punitively for doing this. So all of these things will add up to you have an employee, you don't have a contractor. Now people will often say to me, but I don't know if I'll have funding for more than a year. Newsflash, Revenue Canada doesn't care about your funding. These are the only things they care about. These, I'm pointing up there. These are the only things they care about. They don't care about your funding, your profit margin, nothing. And it won't let you off the hook with them. Are there any questions at this point? And if you have questions, we're going to run a microphone to you. Hiring practices. So do screen resumes. Use some basic techniques. Um, establish your criteria ahead of time instead of getting attracted to, oh my gosh, this guy worked for Apple. Well, for sure I want to have him. Did you say you wanted them to work in a blue chip technology organization? Was that one of your criteria or did you just get attracted by the glamour of that? 
you can do screening interviews over the telephone. So lots of people say one of the reasons why they don't use a rigorous process for hiring people is that it just takes too much time. But you could circumvent some of that time by doing a 15 minute screening interview and find out, look, is their compensation more than your interest in doing? Are they willing to you know, work Saturdays or whatever it is that you know could screen them in or out of your process? And then you could decide of those interviews, which ones do you want to see personally? Uh, behavioral interviewing, which I'll come back to in a minute, and then use decision-making criteria to make your offer. So decide in advance so that you then don't get distracted by, oh, they have some, you know, they have a degree from MIT. Unless that was something you said you had in your criteria, you actually don't want to get distracted by that. Behavioral, uh, so I said I'll come back to behavioral interviewing, apparently not right yet. Uh, you can make reference checks, background checks, you need to be really, um, so you can make background checks into somebody's resume and their credentials, do they actually have what they said. You will finally, probably find it tough to do that yourself, so you may have to you know, hire an organization to do that. If you do anything that's not job related, you need to be careful or else you could be guilty of discrimination. So if you're looking for criminal checks, financial checks, even driving record checks, you need to be able to prove that it is vital to the job. So people said to me, well, they're going to be my marketing manager. They're not handling cash. <laughs> you don't need a criminal record check. And they can claim discrimination if you do that. And probably because many people actually don't pass uh, many background checks, this is why companies like to do them, but they actually don't have that much leeway to. An offer letter. Absolutely. Doesn't have to be all that legal looking, but should be an offer letter. So this is behavioral interviewing. So the principle of behavioral interviewing is that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. Now people confuse that with hypothetical questions. So they ask a lot of questions like, what would you do, thinking they're actually finding out what the person would do. But hypothetical questions are only 10% predictive. Whereas behavioral interviewing questions, where you ask people what they actually did in similar situations, are 40% predictive. So I always say, don't bother with any of those hypothetical, and people, they're not lying. They honestly think that's what they would do. If you asked me what I would do in certain situations, I'm sure I'd give you a textbook answer. What I've really done, though, is just different than what I say I would do. Which says a lot about human beings, too, doesn't it? So let me test you. Tell me about what you did in your job at the art center. Is that behavioral, yes or no? It is not. Why do you say no? Yes, you know, because it's not specific enough. So you actually don't ask them anything. And they can you know, respond to it. So, you know, it's here, it's matter. It's too broad. So his answer is that it's not specific enough. And they're, you're not asking them anything that they can respond to. Correct. You're not asking them about a past experience or about a place where they demonstrated a particular competency or behavior that you want to see. You're just saying, so tell me what you did. You know, this is a good date question, not a good interviewing question. Feel free to write down any date questions I give you if you're in that mode. Number two, what would you do if a team member stopped speaking to you? Is this behavioral, yes or no? No, who said no? Ding, 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 yes. Can we throw the microphone to this gentleman so he'll tell us why it is not a behavioral interviewing question? Well, obviously, it's about something in the future, uh, something that, that didn't happen. It's, uh, it's a hypothetical situation. Exactly. It's a hypothetical question. It's not behavioral. Number three, how do you think you'd be able to help us with fundraising? Behavioral, yes or no? No, very good. Yeah, it, you are correct. It, you know, could be a perfectly good question. They're going to tell you an action plan. If I were to make this behavioral, what would make it behavioral? What steps did you take in your last job to do fundraising? Or if you want to get really specific, you could say, tell us about the toughest fundraising situation you've ever been in and how you handled that. So by the way, absolutes, those kinds of questions give you better behavioral ans answers. Tell us about the worst, the best, the most interesting, the toughest, et cetera. Number four, do you have any experience developing teen programs? Can you tell me about that? Behavioral, yes or no? Now oh, you've disappointed me. <laughs> you did so well the first time. I know. <laughs> no, it's, 
you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's real, real borderline, but you want to know exactly what did they do. So what kind of experience are you looking for? So can you tell me about, so it's, it's, you know, it's darn close, but tell me about a time you developed a teen program and had to overcome some kind of, I don't know, barrier when you were developing it. That would make it more behavioral. Number five, can you give me an example of a time when you demonstrated leadership with people who didn't directly report to you? Behavioral, yes or no? Yes, ding, ding, ding. Yeah, absolutely. And, and notice again the specificity of the question. It's not just tell me about a time you demonstrated leadership, which is behavioral, but I would say it's a poor behavioral question. It's very specific. By the way, if any of you are in job search ever, your job is to take anybody's lousy questions and convert them to a behavioral answer. So I've, I, you know, somebody used to say to me that the fact that the interviewing interviewer is asking bad questions is your problem, not theirs. Can we have a, uh, Joe, can I get a, a microphone over here? What, what if uh, I don't remember these kind of cases? I have done them, but I don't remember them. Um, are you talking about looking for a job? Uh, this, the last question, like uh, about, uh, give me an example where you have demonstrated leadership. I have done them, but they came naturally, so I don't really remember. But are you, t are you asking from the perspective of somebody who's interviewing and you got someone who doesn't remember? Or are you yes, asking me from- as a job applicant. As I'm, a job applicant, okay. And I forgot the case where I showed leadership. <laughs> yeah, so your job is to either remember or do the look over here, look over here instead of over there. So then you convert the question, <laughs> come on. Then you convert the question to, you tell them about a time when you demonstrated I don't know, let's say teamwork with a group of people who didn't work for you. But you don't say the word teamwork, you just give the teamwork example. Okay. Interviewers won't notice most of the time. Not all of the time, and obviously you want to give them the best you can, but they won't. So, and how you, so I'm going to go back to the car model. How you should be categorizing everybody's answers is context, action, results. Now what do you think when people, when you're interviewing people, what do they give you the most of? Of context, action, results. What do they give you the most of? Context, yes. They tell you all about the situation, the problem, your eye, you go glassy-eyed listening to it. And then what do they tell you the least about? The results. It should be the reverse. So you're listening for what result did they cause? In fact, you can even, you know, if you, again, if you are interviewing for a job, you can lead the result. You can say, you know, I reduce turnover in oh, one of my famous ones. I reduce turnover in the P&G pharmaceutical division by 30%. We had a situation where we moved them from one city to another, and we had a lot of turnover because of that, and I developed a six-point action plan. So started with result. Then I went to context, then I did action. So you can flip it around. But when you're interviewing somebody, so they give you the context, sometimes they tell you a little bit about the action, so you write it all down. I, I interview and I write down C-A-R so I can categorize people's answers. I don't want to get so fascinated with the situation that I don't notice they didn't produce a result. And then sometimes I'll ask them, and what happened? And they'll say, oh, well, the project was killed. I can't, I can't believe that, it's fascinating. I asked a person I was interviewing for an HR job that I had once, you know, tell me, give me an example of a time when you worked on a team where you had a problem with somebody and how you resolved that. She said, oh, I had the person fired. <laughs> People tell you the truth. And that's, that's why behavioral interviewing works so well. This is, uh, so the offer letter. It's a legal document. It doesn't have to sound that way, though. You are welcoming people to your organization. You keep it friendly. And if you want, attach a legal addendum instead of making it all full of all those things that it doesn't need to. And here are some of the things it should include. And then here are some of the things it can include. Obviously, a termination clause, non-solicitation. You may have um, confidential and proprietary information, et cetera. The one I don't love seeing is a non-compete clause. They're not enforceable in Ontario. People love to put them in, but basically our courts have said, sure, we'll, we'll allow you to say this person can't compete with you, but then you have to pay them for the period of the time of non-competition. Got a question? 
can you yep can they pay you for like two weeks pay or something and then you can't work in a competing company for a year is that enforceable if you take any sum of money from them um, yeah even if you take a sum of money the courts have said they're not enforceable oh so in theory you could just take it <laughs> I'm sorry oh you mean you take that you so if you, you took, but you have to be paid for the period of time that you're not competing. So like the full period of time. So per se, if they pay me for two weeks, I have to non-compete for two weeks. For two weeks. And then subsequently I can just get compete hired away. by the... Compete okay. away. If they take you to well, court... That's lovely. <laughs> if they take you to court, they can say, well, you didn't allow this person to make a living. That's what Ontario courts have said. And most, of, most of Canadian U.S. courts have said the same thing. They can tell you you can't solicit. So if you sign a non-solicit and then you steal one of their people away or you steal a client away, uh, the courts will support the employer, not you. But on a uh, non-compete, you rule. Yeah, it's one of the reasons I don't like them. Uh, lawyers continue to put them in, by the way, because you'll say, well, if everybody knows this, why are they in? Because they are hoping that you create the psychological effect. Well, I agreed that I wouldn't, so I won't. Yeah. Lawyers are tricky people, eh? Okay. So, I know this is a big topic that I've stuck on one slide, and people spend, you know, years and years researching, doing thesis. You know, this is mostly what we spend our entire practice doing is really talking about this whole subject. Nevertheless, I'll stick it down there as. So when you're working, the biggest issue I hear, especially with entrepreneurs, but any managers, is they micromanage. And the, the, the best thing I've ever figured out on that subject, and having micromanaged people myself, guilty as charged, is that pretty much fundamentally, I think I can do things better than anybody else, especially if I've done them before and been successful. So if you manage somebody who's doing something and it's new or worse, it's in your company, there is a big tendency to micromanage. And there is nothing that drives people nuts, more nuts than that. It's the thing that I spend the most time talking about. So if you can, I know that's real. Okay, don't micromanage. There are lots of things you can find to do instead of micromanaging or to manage how you get results, but that's just not one of them. And I would say, so I'm not going to go through all of these, but um, number three, how many of you are familiar, anybody familiar with the Hawthorne effect? Can describe it? Who, who would like to take a stab at describing it? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, people change their working habits when they're observed. Uh, yes, although I'd say that's more Heisenberg's principle of uncertainty, isn't it? So what is like observed is changed. Like the employees are lazy and then you show up and watch them and suddenly <laughs> it starts working, right? That's what I thought that's what it was. Well, I, but I, I think there is, there's, a, there's probably, you're probably right, there is a corollary point there. The Hawthorne effect was discovered when there was a, a lighting company that wanted to um, sell its lights and they were, they were going to sell it on the basis of, look, here's a feature of our lighting. If you put brighter lights into your organization, you will get more productivity. So first they experimented on their own employees. They brightened the lights in a manufacturing organization and sure enough, they got more productivity. And they turn up the lights again, even higher, they got even more productivity. They said, woohoo, we've proven this. Now you salespeople, you go out and sell this whole premise. And then they turned the lights back down and productivity went up again. Went, wait a minute, that wasn't supposed to happen. And, real, and after over a series of time of studying this effect, they realized it's the, it's the effect of attention on employees. If you pay attention to them, so it wasn't just they were being observed, they were getting some kind of attention and getting something you know, warm and fuzzy, and so their productivity went up. And it's become a more sophisticated principle because if you pay it now, the lighting wasn't actually all that relevant attention. Maybe it wasn't a manufacturing organization if it was terribly dark. But you put the lights back down, that's saying it wasn't. But if you pay them attention that is relevant to them, they are more likely to be more productive. So I say you want to actually pay attention to your employees and don't think that you're doing them a favor because you know, the opposite of micromanagement is not benign neglect. There's, there's actually a happy medium of you're paying productive attention to employees. And that's the thing that I always want to find people to do. So 
Here's a really, really simple tool, A Thousand and One Ways to Reward Employees. It's one of the very few books I ever recommend that all managers have on their shelf. It's a flip through, you know, read in the bathroom, 30 seconds, here's a new idea every single time you go. Policy, you're probably not looking for a policy until about five employees, and even then, even then it's a real basic, maybe a two or three page. You're probably at about 25 employees. That's when you're going to be looking for a real policy. So there's something about 25 employees that there is a phase shift in organizations. And it happens again at 50, 100, 250, 500, 1,000, about like that. And 25 is when people say, they stop saying, you know, we used to be a family. We never had to have process. We just talked to each other. It was all so simple. I always want to say, give up your girlish fantasies of that coming again, not after 25 employees. You're now an organization, girlish or boyish, whichever. And you can get policies fairly easily. I'm not saying it has to be bureaucratic and long and complex, but there just needs to be something that says, here's how we're going to make sure that there is internal equity in the organization. We work with one entrepreneur who, who says, they always say this, okay, I don't want to be like those big corporations. Really? Does that mean you don't want to grow your business? No, no, you want to grow your, in fact, what they really mean is I want to grow my business, but I think I can do it without having to be like big corporations. Well, big corporations thought that too, by the way. And sooner or later, they all ran into the same issues. Anyway, so one of the things he had done was, I let people pick their own salaries. Oh, good. <laughs> really? He said, yeah, when they come in, I say, how much do you think is fair? And, you know, I pay them what they think is fair. I said, so do you have people who are in the same jobs? Yes. Do they all have different salaries in these same jobs? Yes. Do they know that? He says, oh, no. And then the CFO pops up and says, oh, yes. And they're not happy about it. Yeah, no kidding. So you know, some of these things you can't really escape. And internal equity is one of them. Performance appraisal process do have a process. Even if it's a conversation you're going to have over a beer, doesn't have to be complex with you know, big written templates because it's supposed to be a process. The intent of it is not to have a record that you documented of the employee's performance. The intent is actually to develop better performance by giving an employee feedback on what they're doing well and what they could do differently. Well, that could be done in many different ways. It doesn't have to be the standardized format, although at some point you will probably need that if you get large enough. And let's talk performance issues. So. Number one principle, thou shalt manage performance issues. They really don't go away. And they don't do well hidden under the carpet. There are big fat lumps there. And a performance issue is any circumstance that originates with the employee. Notice I don't say that you can blame on the employee. It may not be that they have any power over it, for instance, a medical issue. But it prevents them from successfully meeting their commitments either, either to the company or to their job. And then the, these are some of the things that they conclude. Now, if the employee actually has control over it, clearly you're going to manage it differently than if they don't have control over it. But what I see is organizations who don't manage performance issues, even um, you know, when they are clearly affecting the entire organization because they are medical in nature in some way and the employee has no control. Doesn't mean you can't manage them. You're just going to manage them differently. These are some, I would say, a series of, uh, these are the principles that are behind most performance management um, issues, uh, processes. And then termination. So let's say you get to that point where you're going to terminate somebody. You need to know a couple things. In Ontario, there is something called the Employment Standards Act and there is something called common law. And, and whenever I try to explain this to my US call, colleagues, they get glassy-eyed, so let's see if that happens here. So the Employment Standard Act, is, it is written, and it will clearly say, you know, really there's a maximum of eight weeks unless you've been employed for five years or longer, et cetera. But still, the maximum you can really get is uh, 16 weeks total. I think it is for eight years, employ of, eight, uh, eight years of employment. I think that ends up being the total in any circumstance. But, Common law is the body of precedent law that's been developed over time, and it says that there's a whole other, you know, um, whole other application of the law if, if you go to court. So 
And really in Ontario, unless you are fired for just cause, so just cause means you did something really terrible. You harassed somebody, you hit someone, you didn't show up for work, you um, infringed on a really important safety standard, you stole something from the company, you stole secrets, you stole, et cetera, but you did something really terrible, you can't be fired without paying something in Ontario. So if it's not just cause and you're being fired, and you'll notice that I did not mention performance. In Ontario, courts have really said, which I think is true, that performance is an, a, a subjective thing. And so an, uh, it's quite interesting how many companies spend a lot of time documenting that they have told their employee, you are not performing, you're not meeting our, our standards, our expectations, et cetera, and then the court will say yes and you owe them common law. Mostly common law is paid out on the basis of age, uh, actually the number, one, the number one criteria is length of time with the company, and then age and uh, employability. Those are the three factors. So if you are a over 50 COBOL programmer who has been employed by a company for 24 years, you're going to get 24 months severance. It's usually capped at two years. That's what you're going to get, which is quite above and beyond the 16 weeks of employment standards. So if you're, this is why people, this is one of the reasons why people would prefer to have a contractor than an employee, because then they have to pay termination pay. So these are the just cause things that I talked about before. And the burden of proof, you'll notice, is on the employer, not the employee. I've had probably fewer than in my entire HR career, which is, spans about 20 years now, I would say that I've had probably fewer than 10 times we've ever done just cause. We almost always say, you know what, we're going to have to pay even when it's mixed up with some other stuff. And these are some of the examples. The other wrongful dismissal payment is human rights. And by the way, you can, if you pay the right amount of money and it's not a human rights issue, you can fire anybody for anything you want in Ontario. So as long as you're not firing them because they're black, pregnant, handicapped, all of those you know, um, protected group situations, so as long as you're not firing for those reasons and they can't prove that you're firing for those reasons, you can fire them because you don't like their tie or the color of their eyes, or their handwriting, as long as you pay them the right amount of money. Because people call me all the time, they say, I can't believe my employer fired me for this reason. I said, did they pay you severance? Yes, it's over, it's done. They're like, but I want justice. There, there's no justice, there's money in this case. That is going to count as justice. And they say, if there is a Human Rights Commission complaint, and I'll ask them, they'll say, well, you know, I think I was discriminated against. Great, do you know what the Human Rights Commission will do? And they say, what? They'll reinstate you in your job if you win. Is that what you want? And they can do some other things, but the big one they'll do is reinstate you. And they're like, God, I don't want to go back there. Then why would you go to the Human Rights Commission? Because that's what's going to happen. Do you have a question? Can we, yeah. microphone? Hang on, we'll just get you a mic. Hi, yeah, I have a question about that because my dad was actually fired from his long-term job because he developed a disability, but it wasn't an obvious one at the time that you could physically see. Mm -hmm. And now it's several years down the road and I don't know, is there anything that can be done about that? You mean, is there like a statute of limitations? Yeah. There is, there is one and I don't remember how long it is. So you'd have to look at it. And the fact that he would only know now there might be some exception to that statute anyway. So you have to go onto the website and see what they say. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. That would be an interesting one because clearly they wouldn't. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, that's an unusual one. Yeah. Yeah. Did they pay him severance? No, he never got paid a penny. He never got paid a penny. Now see that. <laughs> How'd they manage that? Sorry. He, I don't think he comprehended because he was getting dementia, so I, didn't, I don't think he actually comprehended what, like we didn't know at the time what was going on, so I don't think he really comprehended what he was entitled to. How long had he worked there? 
like 16 years. Oh, phew. yeah, I for sure look into that. That seems to me to be a, you know, a pretty you know, violent infraction yeah. of the law. Okay. I mean, never mind Human Rights Commission, just common law. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. Again, I wouldn't know how long. And has he been reemployed since then? At a different company? or yeah. um, No, he was repeatedly, because of the illness, he wasn't really able to function that well in the workforce okay. after that. And like he also wasn't covered for disability because he wasn't diagnosed yet. Uh, having to spill. But if he, wasn't, if he wasn't able to mitigate, then that whole common law, and again, I don't know how long, he'd, uh, how long how he should have applied, but I would ask for some legal advice on that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah, for sure. I think that's a big one. Fascinating. So, if you are terminating somebody, here are my tips for termination. So, make it short and bitter. You do not have a long discussion at this point about why somebody is being terminated. You, you know, presumably, you've ha been having conversations. If it's for just cause and this is a one time incident and this is the first time they've heard about it, okay, then you're going to tell them. But it's not a long conversation. This is not a performance conversation. Um, don't do it in public. I've had people tell me they've terminated people in public because they're worried they would get violent. Well, if you're that concerned, so they took them to a hotel lobby, you know, the person bursts into tears in the middle of the pub. Uh, terrible. So, you know, if you're that concerned, then have another person close by in the office, but, you know, don't go somewhere, don't go to the library to do this or Starbucks. Okay? You know, in, in an ideal world, there's been some guiding down of their expectations of their employment. And I realize that's not how it is for everyone, but there are many people who they're fired and they stay the week, they stay, you know, the month, and then they can leave. There's no reason to do this escort people to the door stuff. You know, very rare, unless they have actually broken your trust in some way, they are unlikely to. So organizations often say to me, well, what if they hack into the computer system? Have they done anything to make you think that they would do that again? Like, why do you think they would change overnight? Because they're going to be mad at me. Okay, you know, when I'm mad, I yell. I don't go hacking into somebody's computer system to perform a legal act. Like, really, it just, it's just not likely to happen. You want to treat people the way that you've treated them all along because what happens is how you treat them when you fire them is creates culture with the rest of your organization. And they don't like seeing people that they work with treated like criminals unless they were actually guilty of criminal behavior. Come up with a communication plan with the person, frankly. How would they like to talk to them? I wouldn't let them you know, send out an email saying, oh my god, I've been badly treated. I've seen that happen. That doesn't work well. But if that does happen, you just take the high road and say nothing. Any questions that you have? Please. You talked a lot about behavioral questions. Um, I was just wondering about actual factual questions. So if you're looking for a specific skill set, can like, I mean, is there uh, a deep dive that you can go in without frustrating them too much or is there a certain limitation? So if you're, if you're actually, so for sure you can ask factual questions like, you know, when did you work at such and such a place? Why are you leaving, et cetera? And, it, and really it sounds like you're looking at how can I test out their skill set in functional or te technical skills. So there are other things you can do. So there are some tests. They're not, they're not that many for, it depends on what skill set, but they're usually so specialized that organizations themselves have to develop it. Yeah, of course. Well, you're gonna, they're going to be doing that working for you, right? So I've seen people say, all right, could you you know, I'm going to get you to design a training uh, plan for me right now in, in, in my field. Or could you stand up and deliver a training program? We'll even give you prep, preparation, a week's time to prepare to do it. Sales presentations, I've seen people get up and do that. I've seen them say, okay, come over and sit in front of this computer, so develop this piece of code for me, please. Absolutely, you can, you can do that. Now, would I, would I do it on the first interview? No. So the first interview should be more of an ambassador interview. It's the good cop interview. You are playing good cop. It's when you've interviewed five people and you bring in two people for the second interview, that's when bad cops should show up. That's when you ask the tough questions and you go drilling down those parts of the resume that you're a little you know, suspicious about and you give them the hard tests, et cetera. Because you're also investing quite a bit of time in doing that kind of thing. Yeah, so don't do it all up front. 
That's your question. Uh, yep. Uh, my, my question would be like, how, how would you define like who is guilty or who is like, let's say I was yelling once at, at the general manager and let's I got a were... warning, okay, for harassment. Yes. Okay, so, but um, nobody investigated properly, like yep. what led to that point. Yep. Okay, and I put that one in writing that they practicing some kind of modern day slavery mm -hmm. um, that's copyrighted by me. Uh, because uh, I couldn't stop working for two and a half hour, even for a second, and it was highly physical work. Yeah. I wouldn't put anything and like that into writing, by the way. I wouldn't blog it, I wouldn't Facebook it, I wouldn't talk about an interview. Never slag your, perform your former employers. The new person, that your person you're interviewing with, they don't know you. And what they think is, this guy is a complainer. That's all they know is that you just told them I was, you know, you can say, now you can find some very tactful ways of saying slavery. And you yeah, but also, also I was hit by a wooden clipboard, okay, <laughs> okay. on my head. You just and say, I, you know I what? I didn't want to take a legal action because I, I worry about my further career, you know, mm. but uh, I, I could win it very easily because my character is very outright and, you know. But you don't have to stuff. tell anybody any of that in an interview. They'll just think of you as a bitter guy. All you have to do is say, you know what, wasn't the kind of culture that I worked well in, I'm looking for a whole inclusive and different kind of organization, whatever it is. Keep focused on what you're looking for. Okay, thank Yeah, you. you're welcome. And by the way, I worked in one of those kinds of organizations and I went into my whole set of interviews and I just, I never said anything bad about that company. I do now, because <laughs> it's a long time ago, but, but not when I was interviewing after that. What's your uh, view on using Skype for interviewing? Oh, um, is it um, because it's long distance interviewing or is it a screening interview? Long distance. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you know, you, it's, it's better than just a telephone interview. I mean, you get, you get an idea, did the person actually go to some length to look appropriate to, you know, groom themselves, et cetera. So you get that and you get a little bit of more tonality and expressiveness. So you can see some of that. So, I, you know, I obviously would prefer person to person and eventually I would never hire anybody without having a face-to-face -face meeting with them. Yeah, I hired somebody from Russia once and I spent $7,000 bringing her over to meet her. Yeah, first, I wasn't going to extend a job offer until I'd had a personal interview. You look like you're asking a question on the behalf of that whole crew there, so, <laughs> so make it a good one. It's a group I'm here with every week, so um, you said when you hit 25 employees, you should get uh, an HR person in the company. What if you're smaller than that? Like, can you subcontract that like you might to an accountant or something? Like, if you're a small firm, is it possible to have a subcontracted uh, HR person? Well, I didn't say you had to get an HR person in the company. It was more a policy. Okay. Uh, I think you should be planful about the HR as, as, HR as soon as you hire employee one. But that doesn't mean you have to have an HR person in the company or that you even need external HR advice. Are, are there like external HR contractors? Like are those companies? There are, like yep, there are a few different companies I, that, that you can you know, outsource your HR to. So it depends, you know, if you want something basic like benefits, payroll management, et cetera, which you know, I barely consider to be HR. But you know, if you want that kind of support, that is, I would say, one cost, and, and that's, there's lots of people who do that. If you're looking for you know, employee relations, you know, team building, et cetera, performance management support, it's going to be another level of cost and fewer people. But yep, definitely those companies are out there. Right beside you. Um, just what are your thoughts on using sort of Facebook or Twitter to look up people's profiles? It sort of gets into a murky area of you're going into their social life, but it does say something about the person. Probably shouldn't be delving into it, but I'd like to hear what you think. Well, you know, I know a lot of employers do it. They look at Facebook. For sure, I think LinkedIn is fair game. Absolutely. That's, you know, the business social network. It's the marketplace. It's, it's just, you know, I try to think about all the things in my life that you know, and I'm not on Facebook, and that's one of the reasons. Because <laughs> I, you know, I don't want my clients going on there. I don't want to have to be thinking about it, and I would spend all day long on the computer if I did. But 
if I thought about all the things I would put on Facebook, and I thought, I wonder how my clients would feel about the fact that, oh, you know, like here's one of the things in my life. I have a husband who donated sperm to a lesbian couple, friends of ours, and he has a daughter. That would be on my Facebook. There'd be pictures of her. Our clients can look at that and go, you know, and, do, and a prospective employer can go, you are whacked, man. So I'm not sure, that, now does that have really any relevance on what kind of HR professional I am? Not to me. I think it makes me more open-minded, but, but not to me. But I don't think that I should even be thinking about that if I'm an employer. I don't wanna think about, I don't wanna think about your personal life. It's none of my business. It's not that I wouldn't be interested in it and, you know, and gradually it's going to come out, but I don't need to know that, you know what, you smoke dope on the weekends. Yeah, well, who doesn't, right? But I don't want to know it. I don't want to have to think about it. You know, I don't, I don't, yeah. Uh, I don't want to know that you're going through a, a, you know, a lingering bad romance. Oh, somebody I know, what, what was she posting? It's all over and she's posting things like words, promises. I'm like, oh God, <laughs> drama. That's what I want to post back, okay? Like, I don't want to, I don't want to know all that, right? So, and obviously people do it. Now, my advice on the, the reverse side is if you're in job search mode, get into your Facebook, get people to untag your photos, you know, clean it up because people are going to be looking. Whether or not it's ethical or smart, they are going to do it. You know? Google yourself, find out what's out there, etc. It's probably not the perfect answer you're expecting, but there you go. Josie, you've got somebody behind you there. I uh, avoid, because I've, I was in information, information studies, I avoid for all the same reasons that you mentioned this. But now the, the converse of that is that if you don't exist on Facebook, you don't exist. If you don't exist, I mean, you know, in years past I taught and, you know, students had these, these websites where they would post comments. I think those have vanished by now. But, but you know what I mean? Like things that I can have some control over, I avoid. But what about the converse? If, if, that, if you're not out there now, if you're not blogging, if you don't have your own website, especially in the information field, then it's, then yeah. it's I mean, even as, a, as my little company, which is why I'm here, uh, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. And if you're not really up there, really current, um, it looks bad. So I try to minimize it. But what is your opinion about that? Well, you can, I mean, there are people who manage pay Facebook usually because they're in some kind of B to consumer uh, business, so they need, to have, they need to have a Facebook presence. If you're in B to B, you don't need a Facebook presence. You need a linked book, a LinkedIn presence, as I have. Um, but if you're, you can have a Facebook presence that doesn't say, yeah, I went to a rave on Saturday, it was fab. You know, you can have all that. You, you know, there, there are different, I mean, you know all this, right? So I think that, yes, you have to be pragmatic. Right? You have to be pragmatic. So if you need to have Facebook, if you need to have a Twitter, but you can still, there are still ways of managing your image. Not totally. If you Google me, you will find a friend of mine has, she, uh, you know, I always kind of uh, grown a little bit. She's included my recipe for chocolate pate and a white chocolate sauce in an article she wrote for a newspaper in the US. There you go. Find it at your will, right? And I'm always like, I don't know, this doesn't seem terribly unprofessional, you know? Um, but it's not business related. I want things out there that are business related. Thank Hi, you. So I have another Go. historical question. Um, I worked for a startup at one point. Uh, things went south. Um, the executives were <clears throat> very intent on uh, selling what was left of the company uh, based on whatever goodwill remained and, and uh, perception of value and whatnot. Um, so they laid everybody off. Um, and offered to double severance pay uh, in exchange for signing a release that uh, bound you to not saying anything bad about the company. Yep. Um, and I just wanted to hear your opinion on that, kind of how legally binding it is, um, that sort of thing. That's legally binding. Yeah. Yeah. Is it common? No. <laughs> in fact, if they were going south, I'm sort of surprised they would bother, but that one's not common. No. That's, uh, I would like to, to uh, revisit the uh, behavioral questions. Uh, it's ac actually a uh, specific behavioral question. Questions, yes. um, there is an interview that I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make uh, with a, a new graduate soon, and I would, li uh, I would like your advice regarding what questions would be uh, 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 used to, uh, 
to understand uh, his or her uh, independency, independence and not being uh, uh, attached to others or um, requiring lo lots of care or guidance. Oh. Well, tell me about a time when you were thrown into a new complex situation that had lots of problems to solve and you got absolutely no direction or guidance. What did you do? There you go. Sounds good, thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> Anytime. Got one over here. Oh, two. Okay. Uh, and just back to that uh, gentleman who, who said that uh, the company went south. Uh, actually, he signed some release form and uh, usually on that release form they put like without prejudice. So then it's less likelihood that you can really use it okay. on the court. <coughs> um, generally, for a lot of startups, including us, um, we don't have a lot of resources. And we are sometimes more desperate in, in the hiring process than the other person that's looking for a job. Uh, so for myself, I spent about half the interview trying to convince the other person how awesome our product and our company is. Uh, first question is actually, how much is appropriate? And, and useful um, to spend uh, that part of the interview actually talking about uh, the future of the company. And the other side is, um, is it OK to leave out the bad parts? Uh, and if something comes up two months down the line and they realize you, know, you didn't upfront about the future and some of the hardships that might be coming mm -hmm. up, um, is, is that common? Like, what's, what's your advice for startups that well, sure. um, my advice is actually the same whether you're a startup or not for both of those questions is, first of all, I think you should always be selling people, even when you know you don't want them for the job, which you've usually figured out in the first five minutes. This is why I always say, don't ask more than four behavioral questions, because you really got the answer you wanted in the first two. And then the rest of it, you're just playing it out. Always try to sell your company. You're, this is, you know, those people are ambassadors for you. So you know, always treat them well, always go back to them. So I always believe in selling the company and be clear about what specific messages you want to leave them with ahead of afterward. So I always start interviews by asking them, do you have any questions? I say, I'm gonna give you a chance to ask questions, then I'm gonna ask some questions, then I'm gonna give you another chance to ask questions in case anything's come up for you. I make sure they get lots of chance to ask all the questions that they have. And in their questions, I will make sure that I embed those messages that I want them to hear. That's the first answer. Secondly, I want them to know the downsides as well as the pluses because I don't want them in two months to go, oh, I didn't know this, and leave me in the lurch. You know, we, and we have too many employers. So one, one, of, our, one of our clients is a, um, a bio-waste company. So we actually bring people in. We get them to smell the bio-waste, look at it, like, see, this is what it's going to, this is what your job is going to be. There's fingers in here. You got that point? Okay. Because we had too many people leaving after three days. And they don't even call and say they're not coming back. <laughs> I know it's an extreme situation. But you know, I've also worked where people oversold jobs. And then you know, people found out, oh, I'm typing for a living. Well, then you're going to lose them. So I don't mean to downplay the job. I mean, you'd say to people really clearly, here's what's great, and here's going to be the downsides, you're gonna especially in startups. You're going to have to roll up your sleeves and do your own photocopying. You know? The server has to be fanned every Friday. We don't know why. <laughs> you think I'm kidding, but I've got one of those. Just a quick question. So I've heard of some companies will actually make a candidate sign a non-disclosure agreement for the interview. Yes. Can you tell me why, where, how, what the reasoning is? Because well, everyone's, cause when everyone else is out to get you, paranoid is just good thinking. I mean, that's part of it. I, I think because uh, people believe that they are going to give away information in the course of the interview that will be necessary to tell people so that they will hire and they don't want them to go talk to anybody. Do I think that they are mostly unenforceable? Yes. They make you look very litigious. And if you get litigious as a company, they're going to get litigious. Cyberplex, we had a whole bunch of 26-year-olds taking their offer letters to get to lawyers to get advice on them. I'm like, what the heck? And I realized it was a 26-page, nothing but legal. There was no welcome to the company, nothing. So they got litigious. So we revised it so it was an addendum. But yeah, same principle. Take one more question and we should wrap up. The good answer guy. Well, thank you for that, but only on a good day, I guess. Um, we're working on a startup where we're, we're, we're sort of not necessarily needing the full-time employees and not necessarily the, the 
contractors either. We're sort of looking at collaborators, you know, this emerging sort of field of collaborators. However, we're not quite certain where that sits legally and how do we exactly approach them? You know, what do we do about these Let me collaborators? Tell you exactly how? where it sits. It's going to so you can call them whatever you want, but when you answer these questions, are they going to work at your office? Hmm. Are they going to use your computer, your equipment? Are you working full time? They have only you, or are they working for anybody else? Hmm. They've been with you for a year? I see what you mean. Yeah, congratulations, you have an employee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you all for coming, and uh, appreciate it.